Forward Guidance is brought to you by Van Eck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about Van Eck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. An extremely important discussion today. I am joined by Michael Howell of Cross Border Capital and the Capital Wars Substack, and by George Robertson of the Monetary Frontier Substack. Great to have both of you here. Welcome. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks, Jack. I am really excited for this because both of you have been on the money and very right on where the economy and the stock market has been headed. I've interviewed you know, both of you on this program. And George, you said in November that stocks will soar as extreme government money printing continues. And uh, Michael, you've been on my program many times talking about how a surge in Federal Reserve liquidity is going to fuel a bull market in stocks, gold, and crypto. So basically, risk assets are going to crush cash and crush bonds. And just we're going to have a, a bull market in uh, everything that's that's risky. And that has played out. So I, I first of all want to roll out the red carpet to both of you on having been very correct on where the market is headed. That, as both of you know, is where the agreement between both of you stops, because you have two very different explanations of what has been driving this bull market. Uh, Michael, of course, you have been talking about how it's a, a surge in global liquidity, and it is the, the central banks and particularly the Federal Reserve that is enacting monetary stimulus, even as it's raised rates, even as it's reducing its balance sheet with quantitative tightening, that they have been injecting liquidity into the system. And George, you are on the complete opposite side of the spectrum. And you actually think not only does the, maybe there is such so, 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 uh, liquidity, but you go, I would say quite far and say the Federal Reserve does not matter right now at all. And even what we call the you know the the yield curve, the treasury yield curve is not the real yield curve. So you two are on totally opposite sides of the spectrum about what is fueling this this bull market. Um, let us just first get up your, your general views about liquidity and what has been driving this bull market. So I, you know, I hope this will be an exchange of views, a, a respectful debate. Michael, let's start with you. Uh, why were you and George right that stock, stocks would rally? And in your words, what have been the conditions of global liquidity uh, that has been rising, that has been driving the, the bull market that you and George correctly predicted? Let me kick off um, in terms of the views. We started to get pretty bullish around um, September, October of 2022 in the wake of the British guilt debacle, which uh, some people may remember was when the incoming new Prime Minister Truss uh, outlined um, uh, a package which didn't make any sense to markets. And the British Treasury market sold off very aggressively. Now, we thought that was a wake-up call for policymakers worldwide as to what could go wrong because we, fe we figured that we were facing uh, a long-term outlook where you were likely to see a significant deterioration in fiscal finances across the Western economies. And uh, this basically mattered. And so it was likely that something would begin to change uh, at an extreme. We then got the SVB crisis uh, in March of 23, uh, and that was another wake-up call. And what we've been seeing pretty much progressively from those two starting points is more liquidity being inched into markets by policymakers. Uh, the Federal Reserve has increased what we call liquidity injections, which is the active part of its balance sheet. Uh, it's been doing that uh, pretty much, or aggre we would say pretty aggressively, uh, since March of last year. Uh, it began to inflect around the time of the British guilt debacle, and uh, bank reserves in the U.S. have risen uh, pretty consistently uh, thereafter. They're sidelining a bit or going sideways a tad at the moment, but uh, notwithstanding, we think that in the medium term, they're going to keep going. In terms of that liquidity cycle, uh, we envision that that is likely to peak out sometime in late 2025. That would make it a normal cycle. In everything that we see here, in markets, we think this is a very, very normal investment cycle. Now, I want to make two uh, further points. One is that we're talking about global liquidity, which means that there's not just a Federal Reserve dimension. Uh, the Federal Reserve is very important in terms of this upswing, but it's not the whole story. One's also got to look at what's happening in Japan, uh, what's, looking, uh, what's also happening in the Chinese financial markets. And we've got to also extend the frontier beyond What's just central banks do? We've got to look at cross-border flows. They've been affecting emerging markets quite positively. Uh, to look at what's happened to the emerging market uh, uh, yield market, a high yield market, that's uh, rallied strongly. 
emerging market currencies haven't had the sort of debacle one would normally see uh, in uh, a rate tightening cycle in the US. So there is a, a global dimension uh, to all of this as well. And um, the second point I want to make is that we do agree 100% with what George says about the distortion in the yield curve. You know, hat tip to him. I, he has a different methodology for looking at this, but I think it's a more straightforward one than ours, but he comes pretty much to the same conclusion. Uh, and that is that the yield base of the US Treasury market is very heavily distorted by uh, the activities of both the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. Thank you, Michael. So the term liquidity in markets, if something goes up, why? Because there's liquidity. It went down. Why? There's there's no liquidity. Very slippery concept. Hard, hard, hard to define. But Michael, I'm saying you, you actually you know, have done the work to attempt to construct a global liquidity index where you add up the you know the money from central banks, the money from private credit creation and, and cross-border flows. So you have this index uh, and your, your index has been rising and that's why you've been bullish on stocks. George, Correct. you've been bullish stocks uh, for particularly a, a completely different reason. Tell us why, as, as well as you know any potential disagreement you might have with, with Michael's view. I think as, as far as like well, why I had prescience perhaps on why the stocks were going to go up was really a, a, a different worldview than, um, well, it, this is my worldview, is that there's the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, this has been a reality since the end of World War II. And after the fall of the USSR, it was even um, augmented. Uh, we have 40,000 US troops in Japan. Uh, we're occupying Germany still. We are the, the center of like uh, war and peace around the world. Uh, and of course, uh, the likes of Putin and others uh, do this or that. Now, what has this got to do with the stock market? Well, what it's got to do with the stock market is that, and it's actually a help shift, you're going to be a bit lazy, is there's no need to really analyze anything else, especially if your idea, if your focus is on the S&P 500 in terms of uh, what's happening outside the domain of the U.S. and U.S. institutions. There's no flows to back any other conclusion. Uh, there, there is no cross-border flows of note. Uh, I'd say, I don't know, 90% of those are, are trade identities, uh, especially after uh, um, China entered the World Trade Organization. And there's, there's really no um, a star chamber, either an unorganized network or actually a deliberate network where people get together and talk about how we are going to like uh, put money over here or over there or, eat, or 10 o'clock, we're all going to drop our pencils and the ECB is going to generate some, some money. Uh, the Fed's going to generate money and it's going to do this or that with some sort of um, uh, organization. And again, whether this is an unorganized network or an organized network, doesn't really matter because I don't think it exists. It does occur often when we get into lulls and they can be long lulls in terms of like uh, where the obvious factors that are into the market, they're still there, they're, they're always there, they're going on week after week after month after month. And I think people get bored um, or it's, it's not considered a good enough product to offer up in terms of analysis. And so they start to look at China and they start to look at the UK and they start to look at at various other countries when all that matters is what the Uber driver in Ohio is doing and uh, how he's fared for the last six months and how he's likely to fare for the next six months. And then you think of all the 330 odd million Uber drivers, uh, let's just use that as an illustration. I can't find any data uh, that has the UK influencing what's gonna happen, the S&P 500, uh, either as a leading indicator. From time to time, Canada has some interesting things to give our way, but that's just because of the um, a real crass and ugly way to state it is that that's just the 51st state uh, in terms of its economy. And so, um, and also Canada has uh, a quarter system in terms of how they set the Fed funds, uh, or excuse me, their central bank rate, uh, which is what the U.S. used to do, the Federal Reserve used to do, um, and the U.S. still stays at a floor. So therefore, Canada does give us some insights. But as far as for um, influence in the S&P 500 and the stock markets and risky assets in the U.S., there's, there's no international factors that exist but for war. Uh, if war kicks in, as we've seen with Ukraine in terms of its impact on oil and um, oil price and, and various other things, if China gets scary in terms of Taiwan, yeah, you bet. Uh, but that's more of a function of the fiscal changes that the U.S. has to uh, put on its, its, uh, its books in response to the national defense. But as far as any sort of uh, financial monetary 
you know, they just don't exist. And I would, I would actually um, say that if you identify that there's, there's such a thing as a global liquidity, uh, I think the uh, uh, not, not not to not to not to get the the boxing gloves on, but I think that's a spurious correlation. In other words, if you search hard enough, you can find indexes after the fact. Even after the fact might be five minutes, but after the fact, you can get all sorts of neat indexes like uh, uh, what's the coffee price influence on steel making in the United States. Everything comes in and out, but the thing I would watch and I do watch and have always watched is what's the Federal Reserve up to uh, in terms of its actual cash flow? Um, I don't really think there's such a thing as liquidity. Uh, it, the, the, the Fed, and uh, if you allow me to just de uh, deal with just the United States, the, the Fed, not since World War II, um, and they didn't even do it during this COVID period, has actually put money into the country. Um, there are very small trim tab, which because of the law, uh, that divides mandatory and discretionary spend from Congress does have influence. Uh, they, they can tighten, they can ease, but it's a small fraction of what the actual innate U.S. economy is doing, uh, given just the, the, just the sheer immensity of the United States and the constitutional powers that have been granted to Congress. So now if Congress is tied up in sort of a, a five-year forward plan of like what they can spend and not spend and and you can have some sort of uh, forward look in terms of what that's going to be. But yeah, the Fed matters. Uh, and they, they, they can have a, a influence. Uh, Volcker proved it uh, with uh, what he did. But by the way, that's the only time the Fed's ever proven that they can handle inflation. Uh, they, they thereafter acted like as trim tap, uh, where they just did a very small amount of tightening or easing, which um, influenced the market that gave the forward expectations thesis, that's the new Keynesian thesis, which has actually just gotten out of hand totally, which is that the forward expectations of what the Fed's going to do is all that counts. And it dominates or is at least a, a, an equal with the fiscal posture of, of uh, that Congress gives us uh, or exogenous events like COVID. Uh, and it's not. It's, it's, it's an administrator. It's the, federal, it's the federal government's bank is what the Fed is. It was never a policymaker. What's happened is that given what happened with the GFC uh, and the Fed moved to a completely radically new way of operating, which is this, which is called Neo Wicksell Woodford or, or have, whatever you might want to call it. Uh, and it's, it's, there's a lot of material that uh, started with Woodford's uh, 2012 presentation at Jackson Hole, where the Fed just shifted to Ford markets. They, they don't even deal with the now, here and now. All they do is talk. And Woodford actually explains very carefully that they, they have to talk about the criteria going forward, not, not in terms of what they're actually do. They can't set down exactly what they're going to do. They can just set down the framing of what they can do. Uh, and that's supposed to be monetary policy. Well, that, from my point of view, means that the Fed just left the play field, that especially when there's an exogenous shock like COVID, uh, the Fed's not evolved. Uh, there's, they're always just a small trip tab. So if they, if they actually expect that forward expectation management is all they have to do, well, sooner or later, people start to poke at it and they, 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 and then more and more poke it and they say, okay, that's great. Two years from now or a year from now, we trust you. You're really serious about it, but what's going to happen now today? And I think that, uh, what's, what's, what's evolved and what is about to evolve in a big way is that the Federal Reserve doesn't matter. So as far as calling stocks, it really was sort of almost a, um, a meathead approach is that if the federal government's going to spend 7.5 trillion uh, gross, uh, which is what they did do uh, before tax, taxes raised, and not only that, that, that 7.5 billion a trillion went to the lower cohorts of the U.S. economy, and the taxation, which dropped it to a net 3.5 trillion, uh, was from the upper cohorts in terms of income um, and corporate tax. So that that 7.5 trillion actually was close to I don't know six trillion, six and a half trillion in terms of the actual immediate effect upon the U.S. economy. How the hell can you have any sort of respect in terms of e economics? Uh, in terms of uh, in looking at what the Fed flows are. Um, and so the Fed is present 
and it certainly dominates sentiment. Like, uh, you know, most people, they hear what I just said and they say, ah, he's a, he's a, he's a nut. Everyone knows the Fed's all dominant. Everyone knows that not only that, the Fed hangs out with the Yellen as the bridge with the ECB and Lagarde and everyone gets together and they plot out exactly what's going to happen for the next six months, which we will find out as the stock market moves or whatever. I say that's bunk. I, I, I say that, uh, yes, sentiment matters and the Fed is the principal definer of sentiment right now. And I think it's, I think what we saw last week was the start of the, the end of that, uh, that grip on the market. Uh, it, it was almost like a near panic. I thought in terms of cash carry, all these other guys coming in and, you know, and Boskin says this and cash carry says that clearly orchestrated, clearly everyone had like six talking points in front of them before they go out. There is no independence with all the FOMC and the uh, regional fed uh, governors. And so I think people will start to deal, have to deal more and more with the reality of what the actual economic flows are. And right now, this is about the easiest time we've ever had in terms of seeing what's happening. Uh, it's no mystery. I mean, you, you just uh, you talk about the deficit. You, it's right there. It's right in front of your face. It's like a two by four hitting your head. And so unless there's like a two to three trillion dollar tightening that comes from at this point, only Congress can deliver that. The stock market has only one way to go. Uh, now, it might be uh, the nominal growth might be inflationary. It might not. Uh, but the stock market's going to continue to go up. And probably inflation's bottomed out and will we'll go up a bit, too. This will carry on until um, you know the, the likes of Professor Keene from Australia and, uh, and the likes and the others, uh, when until the it's recognized that there is no Fed effectively. And so private sector capital, um, mostly in debt, will start to go to fund this ever rising risky asset values, uh, which will be ever more leveraged. And that, of course, is a standard Minsky and Ponzi uh, stage. Um, again, none of this stuff is nuanced. It's, it's very difficult to argue with me that, that the net spend of the fiscal government was 3.5 trillion. And it's very difficult to find any sort of tightening from Congress that will, will take away the, the exuberant edge of that, which was way over $3.5 trillion. It's impossible to argue with me that Congress is suddenly, like a month from now, going to come up with a $2 trillion you know, raise in taxes. Um, they all, you know, they want to get elected. Congress is in chaos right now. I think this is one of the sweet, one of the, the sweet spots where characters like myself can actually come up with a cogent of... Um, idea of what's happening and also be able to predict what's likely to happen. And it, it just has nothing to do with a global global situation. And I, I also don't think there's such a thing as liquidity. Every asset has a liability. Every liability has an asset. It's it's all in a, a, a tearing up of T accounts. Um, although that uh, that K thing we, we learned about, like how much banks can lend and create money is really no longer applicable, but it does give an idea of how the T accounts will keep swelling and swelling and swelling. There's really not much debate that's available today, I think, in terms of this approach. George, thank, thank you for that. In your view, not only are you, are you doubting the predictive power of liquidity or the, the power of, of liquidity on financial markets, you deny its existence. And you, in, some, you know, in some way you said the Federal Reserve does not uh, even exist, meaning the Federal Reserve's power uh, doesn't even exist. So George, I, I take it that, for example, and I, you know, I know this is something that Michael has talked about, the decline in the Federal Reserve's reverse repo facility, which we'll get into that in a second, Michael has attributed you know, a good part of the rally in risk assets to that draining of the reverse repo facility. I take it that you completely disagree with that. Is that correct? Yes. Now, Michael, could you uh, explain how you think the decline in the reverse repo facility uh, you know, boosts, boosts liquidity and gets into the stock market? There's a whole lot of things here to chew on, I think. Yes. I mean, but let, let me get to the specific points first. I mean, in terms of uh, the reverse repo, the reverse repo is basically money or represents money that was held uh, at the Federal Reserve and was not circulating in US money markets. The rundown of the reverse repo, the reverse of that, if you like, is pushing money back into money markets in the US and it's fueling an increase in liquidity uh, in the same way as... Uh, an increase in the Treasury general account um, would basically deplete liquidity. So what we're doing is seeing an increase in liquidity. And basically, in the course of the last uh, 12, 15 months, what's happened is something like uh, very close to $2 trillion has come back uh, into uh, money markets, courtesy of the rundown of the reverse repo. 
I would argue that was a deliberate policy to do that. Uh, that was probably part of the reason uh, that Janet decided to fund at the front end of the curve to go through bills rather than coupons. Uh, that's a very unusual move in the context of Treasury uh, funding. Uh, and maybe there's an explanation there. But, you know, it's curious. All I would say is it's curious to punch in what George is saying. But a lot of these particular events seem to be coinciding very closely with uh, shifts upwards and downwards in, in Wall Street. Uh, so I would argue that money matters. George's reference to the T accounts and the uh, increase and decrease in the size of the T accounts, uh, I go along with, but that's basically liquidity. Uh, liquidity is your ability to transact in markets. And the ability to transact is obviously to do with or connected with the size of the financial system. Uh, and if financial intermediaries are increasing their balance sheet size, uh, that by definition is a source of liquidity. Liquidity has a quantitative dimension, uh, which is what we try and calibrate. It also has a qualitative dimension uh, in the sense that it basically allows duration or it forces duration in the system to reduce. So in other words, if, you're, uh, if the Federal Reserve is buying a treasury from the private sector and replacing that with cash, the private sector is losing duration and will basically have to uh, uh, somehow lever up by uh, buying duration elsewhere in the system. And ultimately, that is a way of the stock market going up. This is not just a US phenomenon. This is happening in other markets as well. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Japan, uh, exactly the same phenomenon is happening. The Japanese stock market's been strong. This expansion in liquidity in Japan has also had a detrimental effect on the yen, as we know. Um, you're starting to see a similar impact in China, but in China, the stock market is not the most important element. Uh, what you're seeing is because of the dominance of the People's Bank in terms of the Chinese economy, what you're seeing is that beginning to get traction in Chinese economic activity, which is one of the reasons that commodity markets are going up. Uh, so I think you've got to take into account a global or an international dimension uh, in these things. I'm not disputing the fact that the US system and the US dollar is uh, dominant worldwide. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's plain. But there are clearly other influences that go, that go on. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm the first to say that Britain is, uh, is well and truly eclipsed. So I would actually have no truck with George or the fact that the UK probably has no influence or very little influence on Wall Street whatsoever, uh, much rather the other way around. But you've got to accept the fact that if one extends the analysis out to fixed income markets, uh, there's a very, very important international dimension there. For example, if the Chinese decided they were going to liquidate their holdings of US treasuries, or similarly the Japanese, it would have uh, probably a very significant impact on the US treasury market in much the same way as the wall of Japanese buying uh, from the mid-1980s the mid had a very significant effect on US interest rates and yields. Uh, and that was one of the very first instances where we saw the impact of liquidity uh, in global markets. But, you know, I think one has to go all the way back to probably the mid-1970s uh, with the ERISA Act in the U.S., which basically facilitated the, diversion of US, the diversification of U.S. pension funds, which really underscored a lot of these international movements in markets. And U.S. pension funds and U.S. money began to move overseas, which is why you've got uh, American uh, investment banks uh, you know, well ensconced in uh, major cities worldwide. Uh, we're an international financial regime. Uh, the dollar is still dominant. I'll come quietly with, uh, uh, with George on that. We're still, in my view, very much in Bretton Woods 1, and long may that continue. The dollar is dominant, and the dollar will remain dominant. And uh, the U.S. Treasury is probably doing all efforts to ensure that that's the case. But there is liquidity. There has a global dimension. We can track it. We do that. Uh, I'm more than happy to share charts with, uh, with Jack and demonstrate that that fact statistically, uh, you know, uh, uh, after the show, and you can include it in the slides. Uh, and, you know, the Federal Reserve is not the only game in town, that's for sure. Uh, I don't believe that interest rate setting by the Federal Reserve is that important in truth. So uh, maybe I'm agreeing with George on that dimension. And I think the only forward guidance that's important is Jack's show. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe we're in some agreement there, but uh, there is definitely liquidity. That's what's been moving markets. Fiscal policy is certainly important. There's no, there's no question there. But the key question is, how is this being financed? Uh, it's being financed increasingly by monetization. And that is the worry that we've got longer term. 
And that's probably the reason why you're seeing Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and gold uh, all continually going up now. In 2017, Forward Guidance's exclusive sponsor, Van Eck, was the first ETF issuer to file for a Bitcoin-linked ETF. Seven years later, Bitcoin ETFs are finally available. Using the Van Eck Bitcoin Trust ticker HODL, you can invest in Bitcoin with zero fees until March 31st, 2025. That's right, zero fees until March 31st, 2025. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today or visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. Now, the disclosures. An investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL, involves significant risk and may not be suitable for all investors. You could lose your entire investment. The Trust offers fewer investor protections as it is not registered under the Investment Company Act of 1940 or as a commodity pool under the Commodity Exchange Act. For a complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the Trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. You can learn more about HODL and its zero fees until March 31st, 2025 at vanek.com slash HODLFG. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. And now back to the interview. Thank you, Michael. I Before I, I hand it over to George, I g- got to explain a few things. The Treasury General account is the U.S. Treasury's basically checking account with the Federal Reserve. And the Treasury is fiscal. Congress decides how much money to spend or not spend if it wants a surplus, which last time I think they did that was you know over 20 years ago. Needless to say, the U.S. now has a, a deficit. And George is definitely in the fiscal dominance camp that it is what Congress decides. And Congress is printing three and a half uh, trillion dollars a year. When I, say, when I say print, I mean running a, a deficit. Public sector deficit is a private sector surplus, and that's part of the reason why the economy is so strong. Michael, focusing on, on uh, fiscal, but also focusing on monetary, the Federal Reserve Central Bank, which has very little to do with Congress. And when you know we talk about the Federal Reserve quote, printing dollars, it is almost always printing that dollars and then swapping those for dollars with the rest of the, the financial system. So expanding its its balance sheet, and, and that is... Uh, um, Money within the private sector, particularly the banking sector, where it is very hard or often hard definitely to, to get out in the real economy. Like the Bank of Japan printed an enormous amount of money doing quantitative easing, and it had deflation or exceptionally low inflation rather than you know runaway inflation. The much anticipated inflation from quantitative easing at, in the 2009 in the US, of course, never occurred, uh, although you know, we did have some inflation in, in 2022. And then, sorry, I just got to go, go through it. The thing about the reverse repo facility, yeah, that's basically an effective deposit facility with the uh, Federal Reserve. And there was too much excess liquidity in 2021 and, and 2020 that it was parked, uh, funds, money market funds parked it with the Federal Reserve. And now that money is flowing back out into the financial system because the Treasury is issuing low duration Treasury bills instead of coupons which money markets can buy, you know, money market funds typically don't buy a 10 year note or a 30 year bond, they want to buy a six month, three month bill. And that is uh, increasing the supply of bills. So making them net more attractive to the money market funds that have, you know, it's a few basis points, but they, you know, it's on, it's on it's like five, five trillion dollars or something. So it, it definitely matters. And then there's the core idea of when the central bank prints money, again, when I say money, of course, we're always talking about bank reserves, which are the liabilities of the Federal Reserve and the assets of commercial banks and maybe some money funds, but not you and me in the same way. You know, it's not what you and I were, were have money or even what Apple computers would, would call money. But when that when the Federal Reserve does that, it takes away an asset and it replaces it with a sterile reserve with a, with a duration of zero, basically the least risky asset imaginable, just pure, pure cash. And that th- then drives the private sector who just got their asset bought by the Federal Reserve or swapped or loaned or something like that, and to to replace that collateral, and then they buy it from someone else, and then someone else buys it from someone else, and then you buy a three month Treasury bill, and then you buy a one well, one year Treasury bill, then a two year Treasury note, a five year note, a ten year note, then you buy a mortgage backed security a- uh, agency, you know, no credit risk, then you buy a non agency one, then you buy a corporate bond, and then you buy. Uh, high yield, and then you buy leverage loan, and then you buy uh, you know a somewhat low risk stock like Coca Cola. Then you buy Apple. Then you buy a very high beta stock. Then you buy Bitcoin. Then you buy ETH. Then you buy you know uh, extremely high beta uh, speculative uh, uh, meme coins. So you know, that that is the so called narrative. Obviously, I, I took it to a somewhat r- ridiculous level, uh, and that is what is referred to, I believe, as the portfolio rebalancing theory. George, empirically and theoretically, why, why do you think that that theory is wrong? Well, I think you, you touched on the big one, which was Japan proved it was wrong. Talking about quantitative easing, it was uh, it was uh, uh, massive. 
um, and uh, they just stopped it. And look what's happening to assets and and uh, uh, rates. Exactly the opposite that quantitative easing was uh, was thought to have done. So I, I'm actually sort of curious about the how can the portfolio rebalancing theory exist now after we've had 20 years of Japan proving that it doesn't exist. Right now, the the world's so full of these major factors that are inconvenient. Uh, to digest or to to look at straight on because it, it upsets the the popular sentiment, the popular view, the, the things that that I think that you just uh, recited. Um, the flow of funds tables, uh, which Mike is very very aware of, um, Michael's very aware of, is the the Fed puts out every quarter the Z one tables, and they're they're always worth a look, but they're especially worth a look the last couple of years. They show nothing of what you just said. Uh, they, they show nothing in terms of uh, a rebalancing in terms of the household holdings or corporate holdings or or all the users and abusers of U.S. treasuries uh, has pretty well been unchanged. Um, there hasn't been like um, endowments have suddenly booted out their treasuries and bought uh, risky, uh, you know, sea tranche mortgage backed security uh, derivatives. Uh, it um, it never happened. The idea that that this quantitative easing was an easing is is uh, again I, I think Japan's proven it that that's just not true, um, and I think it's not true because I can't find the flows and everything that that uh, all the treasuries went right into the Fed and then they went right back in the in the reverse repo market and they went right into reserves and and basically what it was was the Fed gave the banks the money to raise reserves. Uh, to offset the quantitative easing. In other words, um, quantitative easing was actually reserve management, and it was so in Japan too. It was it was the the Fed for maybe good reasons was just had the heck scared out of them in in the uh, um, 08 to uh, 2010 episodes, and so they said never again, and we're never going to have this fractional reserve basis of under 10 percent, especially for the too big to fail guys, and we're going to raise everyone's reserves up to 40 percent. You know, they played with 50%. Now they don't know what the reserves are. Quantitative easing was just reserve management. Uh, what was created in terms of so-called liquidity was just went right back to the Fed. Uh, and that's the case today. Now, reverse repo um, is a really good illustration of this point, is that reserve re- reverse uh, repo is not a facility. It's It's a window. It's not like they 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 load it up with like uh, you know two trillion of reverse repo and put it here in this in this facility, and now it's being depleted. It was simply the bank window, uh, the Fed bank window being opened and allowing a certain sector of the money market funds to access it in ter- in, in versus all the other investments that they could do, and uh, which they do do. Um, the reverse repo wind down is pretty well right on track with excess savings uh, that, uh, of course, uh, FPUC, I love those acronyms, FPUC, uh, uh, the unemployment, federal unemployment insurance, uh, you know, raised up to uh, excess savings to about, oh, two and a half trillion bucks. And that's now down to about 500 trillion. And it's pretty well, it's, it's like maybe, I don't know, a quarter ahead of what reverse repo is showing too. And I say that reverse repo is is just um, not just it is the massive amount of um, that part of excess savings that went into money market funds, uh, along with uh, the PPP loans that were, were, were uh, sort of like the counterpart to um, the federal unemployment insurance uh, that went to small businesses, small businesses, not large corporations, um, and they're being used. Um, and a lot of the concern that people had, so, oh, this is the quarter that uh, uh, growth is going to stop or it's going to wane. All the all the very good an- analysis, by the way, of people looking for the next recession was all based on the idea that, uh, you know, okay, this, this huge flow that came into the market in 2000 um, into 2021 is depleted and it's actually uh, now, now they're going to like, now they're going to get it and get it good because they got to fund all this debt. Um, and instead, what's happened is that the innate NGDP growth, um, I think a pretty well classical Keynesian, not new Keynesian, but Keynesian ideas, uh, pump priming took off and uh, everything's carrying on. And so that, that excess savings depletion 
uh, and it never really, it never really went to negative. Um, so the the innate NGDP growth actually created the the norm of excess savings about I don't know to mid twenty one or so, maybe approaching twenty two. And so the the economy hasn't blinked, but it has used up some of that excess savings. But now it has still some excess savings left. Same with the PPP money, which which I think is what the uh, the basis for the RRP is. It is not a facility. It is not being depleted. It was not an injection of money. It was uh, it was the results of the of the fiscal spend from 2020 to 2021. And and again, I I, uh, I don't want to be a fool, so I, I've looked at this five times a Sunday trying to find the numbers. Like, okay, we're, we're first. I can't find the RRP facility anywhere in the Fed lexicon. I can't find the I can't find the Fed ever going to Congress and saying we'd like the slush fund of RRP to inject money into the system. Um, they they never talk about it. I, I don't see RRP ever talked in front of the uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony that happens twice a year by the Fed and so on. Uh, it's just it is just the open window that used to be available only to uh, system banks, which was opened up for money market funds. Point number one, you said that QE in Japan didn't work. Well, I think it worked pretty well, didn't it? Because the movement of the Japanese stock market has been pretty much on track with Japanese QE policy. I, I just want to file. No, it did not work. It was a total failure. However, yeah. Japan did use it for certain other objectives. Uh, and the recent um, slowdown in quantitative easing is having now a detrimental effect on the Japanese stock market. So I think you can track pretty closely uh, the impact of Japanese liquidity on that market. Um, I could actually look at a whole range of markets and do pretty much the same thing, trying to argue that liquidity matters. Uh, we're arguing here about uh, central bank liquidity. It's not the whole question, as I keep saying, but it's an important part. If you come back to the reverse repo facility, uh, maybe it doesn't feature in the Humphrey Hawkins. I can't see any reason why it shouldn't. Uh, but on the other hand, the Treasury General account doesn't feature in the Humphrey Hawkins testimony, but that doesn't mean to say it doesn't exist. And if you look at the way that the Fed accounts for this thing, if the Treasury in the US spends more money, uh, than uh, it gets it in tax revenue, the Treasury general account will fall or uh, it will basically have to fund in the markets uh, in some way. So, you know, there, there's a, there, these things must add up. There, it's arithmetic, it's, it's accounting. And if the Treasury general account rises, it's telling you that US government revenues are exceeding US government outlays. So money is being extracted from the money markets and that money is by definition, not circulating, if that's the case, uh, until it's obviously until it's spent. Now, the reverse repo is exactly the same thing. From what I understood you to say, George, that the reverse repo was a, was a phantom or, or whatever, or, or phone, a phony concept, uh, but it clearly is money uh, that is being withdrawn from money markets because it doesn't feature in US bank reserves. So uh, parry pursue with the increase in the reverse repo, uh, what we saw is bank reserves falling. What we've seen as the reverse repo has been wound down, uh, bank reserves have increased. So there's clearly an, uh, an arithmetic or mathematical relationship between these concepts. Uh, it's money that is not circulating and it's held on the, Fe on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And as the Treasury started to fund through Treasury bills, in other words, very short duration instruments, the money funds, which were specifically being targeted by the Treasury for these issues, uh, began to switch out of uh, the treasury, the sorry, the reverse repo facility into treasury bills. So I think you can actually draw a timeline and a sequencing here, which explains pretty much exactly what's going on. Um, let me stop because I know you had a question you wanted to raise or a statement to make. Sorry, reverse repo is not trading money from the economy. Reverse repo is an asset. It's just like it's just a T bill. It's exactly the same as a T bill. In fact, it is it is a T bill only it's for you know. Later resell. And until it's spent, it must be very money. So you're saying that the money market fund, the guys who put money into the money market fund, have given money into the treasury uh, and it's disappeared? Into the it's Fed. Not a into the Fed, not, not the Treasury. It's not a, it, it's, it is not a reduction. And the reduction reserves well, bank, bank reserves have gone down. And bank reserves represent uh, liquidity in US money markets. It's a pretty good proxy. I, that's just that's a fallacy. I, I can't. I can't even. Uh, I can't I even. Uh, I'll talk about it. 
everything has an asset and a liability. That's how we do dual counting, okay? dual sheeted accounting. There's not just one sided flows that you 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 say, oh gosh, there are 500 billion just came into the market. Oh, 500 billion just left the market. It doesn't happen that way. 500 billion goes into the market, and on the other hand, there's a liability. 500 billion that goes into the market is also has an offset in terms of a lie. It, it, there's there's an, a dual sided accounting that's always going on. Um, there is there is like some technical aspects of like the TGA going to 250 billion, which is just a pissant small amount given the the massive amount of like okay we're not going to issue like 10 years because of the you know because of this yelling who I think she's just pandering to sentiment. So I'm going to, um, instead of like, I, I know I can get these 10 years off in like three months or six months, which is more probably in the schedule of the spend that Congress has allocated, you know, has authorized uh, for the various agencies to, to spend. Uh, but instead, what I'm going to do is just prefund it. These are just prefundings. And as it comes in, then what you're saying is that this is some sort of quasi-permanent thing. Well, as soon as that 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 T bill matures as soon as that actual spend is allocated by the agencies that have the, the authorization to make that spend, and they don't just do it like here Congress did an act, and so therefore it, the next day, boom, it all plows into the economy. It's over like you know the uh, FUP FPUC was uh, uh, an authority for that was a weekly spend. PPP was uh, you know came in and drips you know you just look at the balance sheet uh, or look at the uh, the allocations that the uh, the banks made on behalf of the SBA, that took about 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 a year to put out. Um, the spending is not done immediate, and yet Yellen decided that she's going to do a lot of this stuff in a three month horizon versus like what should have been a scheduled uh, laddered approach for like I don't know the you know the Chips Act I think is a ten year plan uh, and so on. So she's pre funded the spending that will exist. And as she's prefunded this, which, by the way, I don't think is legal. I, I, I think that uh, there's discussions right now that there's limits to how big the TGA could be. Uh, that money will all go out. And so you're, you're describing a world that, that is just convenient uh, to make an argument about the, you know, the importance of the Fed and all these like uh, machinations. But you're describing a world that, that as far as like present value, future value, doesn't even exist. It's that money is going to be spent and that TGA will be spent, will be sent out. And reverse repo is not a facility. It's a window. It, it's, it's just like, uh, I'm a money market fund and I can buy T-bills and I'll put it out. And uh, well, I can't do LIBOR anymore because they, you know, the Fed decided to take that away from me. So I'm going to go do um, uh, reverse repo. And what's going to happen is I don't have to go through the banks anymore because every quarter the banks don't want reverse repo on their books. So they don't want to be an agency. So we have those big spikes and, uh, uh, you know, uh, dislocations at end of quarter, end of year. So the Fed says, well, we don't want that anymore. So we're going to have the money market funds, especially given all this money, not liquidity, money that the federal government gave to various people is going to come into this window directly rather than through the banks. Where does this money come from? The money comes from $7.5 trillion fiscal spend. Yeah, but where, but where does that come from? When the government spends seven and a half trillion dollars that it doesn't have, it borrows it. Where does that money come from? That's Michael's question. Go to the government. The the government opens the they they just say, okay, we're going to issue like uh, instead of like two hundred, yeah, you know, actually like instead of like three billion three month bills, we're now going to issue nine billion three month bills, and we're going to do it every week, and so on and so forth, and cash management bills, and and uh, uh, the usual federal lending. And it, it's it's a gratuitous, like the, the government gives the money to the people to buy the treasuries. Uh, right. There is no there's no separate reality here in terms of like, OK, the, the government spends seven trillion and it doesn't come back. Uh, so the debt's left hanging. But you, you will agree there's a difference between or maybe you won't agree that there's a difference between whether they fund at the front end um, or whether they, front, they fund at the back end. In other words, there's a duration implication. So if they start to fund at the front end, which is what we're saying, that is a liquidity expansion, and that is what changes duration of the system. 
And if investors have a target for their duration, uh, in other words, to meet their liabilities, they need a certain duration of their assets. In other words, a time profile of assets. They're going to start to bid up uh, longer duration asset prices. And what you've seen during a period of liquidity expansion is that longest duration assets are the ones that have risen mostly in price, which has been quite predictable. You know, I agree that we've got to start looking at balance sheets and assets and liabilities. But what I don't agree with is, number one, that assets always equal liabilities, because in that case, you'd never get insolvencies. Um, you know, there's an item on private sector balance sheets called goodwill, which is often a phantom, uh, or even though assets are liabilities. Oh, sorry, we're, talking, we're talking about the U.S. government, though, right? Yeah, yeah, we are, but they, there's no... There's, Let, but let's let's no master the U.S. government first, and then we'll move on to, like, Boeing, Okay. But you know, central banks can become insolvent. Um, let, let's be clear about that. I mean, let's, let's just talk about the United States of America. Okay, I'm, I'm yeah. not bright enough to figure out what the hell Argentina is going to do. Let's just stay with the United States of America. It, it may be it may be bigger economies than Argentina that face that problem. But what I'm saying is that come to come back to let's let's uh, put to one side then the argument about potential insolvencies of balance sheets because assets and liabilities don't necessarily have to equal. But in the United States, at the federal level, they must equal. They must. Uh, it's ridiculous to think otherwise. Uh, uh, from an accounting sense, I'm, I'm ex ante, they must. But ex post, they don't necessarily. And that's, that's why you get insolvencies. Now, the reason that you don't get insolvencies for the U.S. government. Like insolvency, where are we now? Insolvency is the U.S. government? No, no. I think he's, Michael's talking about uh, corporate insolvencies. So the reason you don't is the U.S. government has the ability uh, to basically fund itself through using the Federal Reserve or, or effectively printing securities. That, that's what it's true. We've got a choice they of what it's only it used the Federal Reserve in World War II. They haven't done that since, but that's a, that's a small detail, I guess. No, no, no. They, they've, used, they've used the, the uh, in terms of direct financing, that, that may be correct. But in terms of the Federal Reserve holding government securities, clearly it's doing that because that's what we're debating when it comes to Q, QE and QT. Okay, so in... Phantom, or not phantom. Um, <laughs> you're not right, Michael. It just, uh, quantitative easing has offset it right away. Boom, boom. There is no funding of the U.S. government. Now, let's let's just go to the duration impact, which which might be the, the most obvious thing to discuss that we could have an agreement. Um, you're around then uh, when Fisher canceled the 30-year. The whole 30-year bond was canceled. Um, with the same idea, explanation, idea, and forward view that you just said, um, and you said, Jack, too. What was the effect on 30-year rates, uh, or let's say anything beyond 10 years when he, when he canceled the 30-year? Obviously, it's a trap question, but if you, want to, <laughs> if you want to charge into it, I'll let you. But what happened was four days, four days of longer, longer duration and longer bond yields dip down uh, and all the stuff like just as you described was all over the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, you know, just go, go read it, it's still available. And then immediately adjust back up. So at that time, the Fed wasn't like piling into the market to set rates. They were just allowing it to evolve because, well, I guess that's what they did. And that's what everyone expected them to do. And it was the, the duration effect of that long end canceling, this case, was only about four days, probably two days, three days. It, it, it was a nothing. And that was a big deal back then. But, but if I recall, but I, I'll stand corrected if, uh, you know, I defer to your knowledge here, George, on that, on that particular dimension. But if I remember, the reason the 30-year was canceled was it was deemed by the Treasury to be a very liquid issue. No, I, I traded the shit out of the 30 year then. It was it was like water. It was it was in fact we're everyone was really pissed off because that that upset at all sorts of bond bases trades and arbitrage and stuff. And everyone everyone I, I can remember uh uh thinking that Fisher was a moron to, to have done this. And anyway, the case I'm leading that has to do now is that the risk-free rate of the United States of America, full faith and credit is determined by the status, the ability to pay, pay down, uh, you know, pay back principal uh, and uh, just the, the, it's risk-free. So that means that the risk-free rate for the 10-year has to be time-adjusted, the equivalent to three-month bills. 
Um, now, if you're Boeing, I think it'd be a really dumb idea to do all my financing overnight money right now. And boy, you, you, you might get really clocked and you might go and solve it. You will go and solve it. That's why they don't do that. That's why corporations don't do that. That's why when they're in trouble, they try to get junk bonds out from 10-year money and so on. But for the U.S. government, and it's not just ex-ante and ex-post, it, it might be because of like the, the Fed is mighty. There's, there's no doubt they're mighty. And they can set prices. They can say like, okay, we in our wisdom, just like Fisher was an idiot, we in our wisdom think that the 10-year, if we drop the rates down, is an effective ease. So we've decided, what do you think, Fred? Okay, Joe, what do, you, what do you think? And they come up with all their PhDs and they say, okay, it's going to be 4%. And the 10 years, 4%. And, it, and it's it's just like what they did to the secondary market corporate credit facility and various other things. The Fed is huge. So, But that doesn't mean the risk-free rate is 4%. The risk-free rate is that rate which goes in and out of the economy and, and has a, a, a uh, you know, fully reflects both the uh, the liability and the asset side of the economy. Um, and that will be there always. And it doesn't matter what people say that the twos to tens are here or there. The risk-free rate, twos to tens, will be as it should be now, five years ago, and five years to come. So to 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 uh to say it, it just doesn't it it just baffled me that after 30 odd 40 years of all this arbitrage and futures and bases and curve trades all the stuff we've done uh as an industry that people would even talk about like you know because of Yellen issuing uh more 3 month bills than 10 years down the road by the way that this is going to adjust rates it doesn't um, as far as the issuing price goes. And it won't, it just, as that three month uh, um, T-bill start to roll off to six months or, or you know, they, they mature and then, then she does replace them with 10 years and 30 years, which she will without a doubt, that will not, there won't be any, you won't even be able to look and see it. You, you look back at all these charts and graphs and you, it, it, it doesn't show as far as the issue price goes. This is, uh, you know, on your topic now, why is there a wider spread between the agency mortgage yield and the 10-year treasury? Because that surely has got a lot to do with funding. Michael, I didn't make a prior agreement for you to ask that question. I'm glad you did. The US has decided many, many years ago, right after World War II, that they would subsidize the purchase of houses uh, by the US public. And the way they would do that is at first just the odd programs to purchase mortgages off the banks, but we had SNLs. So the, the, the mortgage rate wasn't really the risk-free rate, but for that part that went into the, uh, um, into the uh, GSE's coffers. However, after, I don't know, when, when Lou Ranieri and all those characters start the, the industry up, mortgage-backed securities, as far as conventional 30-year mortgages, replaced all of the SNL's holdings. There is no more SNL's. Nobody holds a mortgage anymore. If it's, a, if it's such and such a criteria, and uh, credit rating, uh, which is called conventional 30 years, 100% of that will go into the creation of mortgage-backed securities. To, to speak very, it's, it's not actually 100%, but it is, is very high and it is way higher than it, than it used to be. Um, yeah. you know, I, I, know, I know of a few savings and loans that re are retained, but yeah, that the main model is non-banks making mortgages. Oh, I, I forgot, you have, that, you have that federal home loan bank expert in your pocket. Okay, I'll, I'll back off and I will be corrected. Yeah. But enough for me to make my point. Yes, uh, yes. Sir. Although I'd like to say 100%, it makes it even more dramatic. Okay, let's see, whatever it is, a very, very high amount. That has to be in sync with the the intentions of the U.S. government to fund the more to to fund the mortgages, so people can buy a home, and the home price has something to do with you know the economy and and disposable income and the ability of people to afford the the nut, uh, all these things. So the economy will end up being the risk-free rate that's in the mortgage-backed security. Um, it's Otherwise, they, they couldn't get enough mortgage-backed securities or they, they would have too many uh, and, and the markets would, would have huge permutations and, and it wouldn't be, wouldn't be sustainable. Stripped of the, um, of the cost of making a mortgage-backed security, the 30-year conventional mortgage 
is the best representation. It used to be just the 10 year um, is the best representation of the risk free rate in the seven to 10 year area. Um, I think you you actually agree with me. That being the case, the the risk free rate that is embedded into the economy that's related to NGDP also proves out the standard Fisherian type ideas that the U.S. government, being as powerful and big and as immense and as risk free as it is, uh, no matter how people might cast, you know, maybe we should buy some Bitcoin or gold or whatever, but it is it's probably going to be certainly around in our lifetime very much as it is right now, as far as credit goes, that means that 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 rate is the actual risk-free cost of money. Uh, Once all these uh, uh, procedures that have to be cost in, in terms of uh, making a mortgage-backed security, the actual risk-free 10-year rate. So that spread to the U.S. Treasury 10-year, actually, it it represents a dislocation, um, which I think is going to be temporary. And it also shows the, I, I guess I, I, I could come up with all sorts of spiels, but I think what it is is just that that's because that's what the, the Fed wants as the, as the prime agency for uh, U.S. Treasury markets. Um, then if you use that, that rate, it also, if you say, let's say, okay, the two year is the two year. Um, there's no mortgages there. And anyway, I don't think the Fed's really uh, can corrupt that. Uh, as much that means the two years to this 10 year risk free rate is the curve. And then you can look at just like what the economy's done uh, since 2020. And you say, yeah, that is the curve because that that's that's completely in sync with the uh, 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 normal expectations for NGDP growth. It's in sync with NGDP. It's in, in sync with how NGDP has changed. Uh, and of course, NGDP is nominal. It's nominal. It's, it's uh, inflation plus real. And that proves out the fishery and ideas that Fed funds equal instantaneous real and also instantaneous inflation. Only it's T plus one, two, three, out to, you know, whatever you wear. Listen up, because wow, I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> because this is, this is what we're on the same page here. The adjusted 10 year agency mortgage yield uh, is, the true, is the true 10 year. And yeah. what we see in the market, uh, which is what um, 80, 90 bips below that trading as the 10 year actual is the biased measure. I think it's biased because what the Treasury and Fed together have done in terms of pushing yields lower through a change in the funding structure. That's where I come from. And it explains it perfectly. The last time that happened was in the, in the global financial crisis in 2008, nine, and they did exactly the same thing. They pushed yields below where the mortgage uh, agents, where the agency mortgage market suggested it should be. We would agree on that. I, I, I would, and it, I don't think it's just semantics. I would say they priced U.S. Treasuries deliberately at certain price levels, and I, I think they're out to lunch. I, I think to think that a, a low yield is is an ease and a higher yield, or what what the um, the natural rate would be, is a tightening is just it's just nuts. And we, we've um, we've had all sorts of experience in Japan. Fisher was right. Inflation plus real does equal the the, uh, uh, the U.S. Treasury cost of money or the risk free rate. Also, what's interesting, by the way, is that, Michael, I, I, I would challenge you that how can you agree with me on that, that the 10 year risk free rate is here and this is the curve and then and then start to talk about liquidity. Uh, in terms of bills and one years uh, versus the 10 year, because all the stuff, the twos to tens is, is the economy. Because that spread between the agency mortgage market and the treasury uh, and the treasury market, that is determined by the pattern of funding. So if you look uh, and I can demonstrate, and I will, I will provide Jack with charts, which illustrate that is if you look at how Janet decided to switch funding uh, towards bills and away from coupons, it was that action which caused the dislocation between the agency and the uh, and the conventional uh, treasury market. Uh, and you can see that now beginning to unwind as bill issuance starts to slow and coupon issuance picks up. And so what you'd expect to see are those two uh, yields moving together. In other words, 
uh, treasury yields, conventional treasury yields, have got to pick up substantially and move to where, uh, to circa 5% plus, which is where the agency mortgage risk-free measure, as you call it, is currently uh, signaling. So I think the yields are rising, and I think the yield curve is steepening. And when you see liquidity expanding in the system, you normally see a steepening yield curve. Uh, and that's what I've always uh, uh, known and, uh, and used ever since I, like you, was at Salomon Brothers. It's all about understanding of well, liquidity. How can a, by artificial be too strong a word perhaps, but an administrative rate for the 10-year, and I, by the way, we agree. I, I do think it's it's uh, it's a policy decision that the ten years here and the, the risk free rates up here. By the way, that didn't happen. That never happened for like thirty five, forty years um, until uh, I, I think the date was uh, it was the beginning of twenty one, or actually no, it was more recent than that uh, about third quarter of twenty one. Correct. It did happen before in the GFC. Yeah, so it's it's well before Janet Yellen decided to issue a bunch of bills versus like wait for the ten year. Correct, but if you go back to the GFC, there was a huge amount of bill issuance then. Yes, but I would say that during the GFC, it was useful, if not actual fact, to use the U.S. Treasury ten-year as the risk-free rate. They're one and the same, um, and so the curve was as it should be, given what happened with the the various fiscal spend and uh, monetary at that time. This dislocation didn't start until 21 it's it's it never was there before it was it, it wasn't there for uh, 30 40 years until the uh, you know until the time the mortgage backed securities were created correct because normal funding patterns are 20% bill 80% coupon and that changed as you rightly point out uh, at that time so Janet changed that mix temporarily and it was also changed uh, if you go back to the GFC. But you can't you can't have it both ways. You can't say that the duration management by U.S. Treasury, and no doubt they're doing it, or they think they're doing it, is influencing rates. It's it's setting this this U.S. Treasury rate, which is a pretty big market. I'll give you that. But it can only exist as long as the Fed's in there to the degree they are holding U.S. Treasuries. It's an administered rate. And as soon as they decide, as soon as they stop QE or QT, just this is it. This is where the reserves are going to be here on. That that will close. It will disappear because it requires new fuel all the time to get that dislocation in place. Um, maybe that's what they'll do because they'll start to panic. Okay. But what, where I'm going with this is that if we're in agreement on what the risk-free rate is and what the risk-free curve is, then how can you... How can you say that the duration management of U.S. Treasuries has anything to do with the U.S. economy, which I would think equity has to have some reflection of what's going on with the U.S. economy. It, it, there's large overshoots, undershoots, and and so on. Um, there's no equilibrium price that the that equity hits, that's for sure. But it can't be counter to it. So that if this were a drain or if this were an ad, then it would show up in equity. What do you mean it would show up in equity, George? Sorry. What's showing up in the in equity now is finally realizing the Fed has no power to tighten as advertised from you know the first quarter, second quarter of 2022. Uh, as like Jamie Dimon was given the word to go do this uh, what, with his announcements first quarter of 2022, it didn't work. There is no sign of the Fed tightening. There, you know, as if uh, it doesn't show up in loan creation are the actual money that the system banks create, there's no sign of it. It, it went up a lot, uh, as you would think, with uh, with concerns over the uh, COVID. Then it went down, and then it's just flatlined. It's about maybe plus or minus 50 billion, uh, uh, you know, uh, month to month. So the Fed is not doing anything. So what is doing something, and it, it it's just... I just don't get why it's not the whole focus. Is the federal government just spent you know, stuffed like like uh, like making a goose uh, produce foie gras? It has stuffed the system with the most monstrous amount of money, not liquidity, money. Here's your check every week, six hundred bucks. Here's this. Uh, you're a small business, uh, you know. Okay, I, I, I run a little bodega. I'm, I'm going to get a three hundred thousand dollar loan from the uh, the SBA. Um, it just stuffed into the system. 
and why that is not equated to the 6%, 6.5% steady NGDP growth we've had, and it looks like we're going to keep having, and the inflation, uh, to the pricing of risky assets is, it's an obvious, it's like every 50 years you get a freebie, and this is a freebie. Risky assets will go up. I think, I think we're in agreement on that point, that the, federal, that the federal government is spending huge amounts of money. There's a whopping great deficit. That's one of the reasons we're, up, we're upbeat on the economy, um, for sure. And I, I'm, we're on the same page on that. What I'm saying, what also matters is how that spending is funded, and whether it's funded at the front end or the, or the back end of the market. Uh, that matters a lot for how financial markets move, how the yield curve shifts, how the spread between uh, the mortgage market and the, uh, and the conventional treasury market move. All these things are really important, and that comes on, on to whether they're funding at the front end or the back end. But I think we, you know, we're, we're in agreement that the, somehow the U.S. government, in inverted commas, is creating uh, a lot of liquidity for the system. I think that, that's, that's fairly clear. Um, and I think that what this tells us in every dimension that we're looking at here, whether you say it's a conspiracy that uh, effectively what they're doing, administrate, administering the, uh, the, the conventional treasury yield, they're pushing it below deliberately, uh, they're, uh, they're spending lots of money. Uh, they're trying to make sure that the U.S. banking system is secure. All these things are telling us that this administration wants the market to go up, uh, wants the economy to be strong. And every box you can tick is that equity markets should be treating this favorably. And bond markets should be running scared. You agree that stocks will continue to beat bonds. And both of you had that view. And both of you have been right, uh, but for different reasons. And you agree that uh, the U.S. Treasury yield curve is not the true uh, yield curve for the economy. George, I just want to ask you a, a question. So you, you talked about the U.S. mortgage rate as the you know a more effective rate and a, a spread between the 30-year and the 15-year, of course, which have different durations. But doesn't the Federal Reserve buying mortgage-backed securities drive up the price of mortgage-backed securities and therefore you know, drive down the spread between mortgage-backed securities and treasuries? Uh, or, or, you know, the wonky term, option adjusted spread. So, so for example, you know, the option adjusted spread over treasuries for mortgage-backed securities and so the S&P U.S. Uh, mortgage-backed securities index went from 122 basis points in uh, March of 2020 to then a huge QE about a little over a year later, 11 basis points option adjusted spread. Obviously, that has to do with interest rate volatility, but who else has a huge interest uh, role in shaping interest rate volatility? The Federal Reserve. So, I mean, how when you have you know ultra low mortgage rates in, let's say, the middle of 2021, and you have a housing boom because the risk free rate is so low, or what I would what often what some people call the risk free rate, the, you know, the, the ten year rate is so low, and then the uh, option adjusted spread for mortgage backed securities on top of that is also exceptionally low because the and you know I would say because the Federal Reserve is buying the bejesus out of it, you know, the, the technical term. How does the Federal Reserve not have an impact on uh, on the mortgage market? Well, the Fed, the Fed hasn't really bought that many more mortgage-backed securities since uh, I think it was QE2 was the last slug. No, no, they bought $1.3 trillion in March of 2020. Then the peak right. was in February 2022 to $2.7 trillion, so $1.4 trillion. Those purchases, uh, as the Fed says, are for prepayment runoffs. Like, I, I think, uh, um, I, I can't, I'm all set to be corrected, but I, I think that was just to maintain a certain level or percentage of mortgage-backed securities as they were, not in terms of like the, the mass amount of treasuries that they did with the COVID QE. The mortgage-backed security buying from the Fed hasn't really affected spreads. I mean, think of it. If, 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 uh, and, and also, I think what we're talking about is like what's happened to risky assets from like COVID to, to date, not in terms of like from GFC to date. Uh, this Maybe I'm being slippery on this, but let me give me that is that the mortgage-backed security has tracked the, the, the home prices and the mortgage, uh, you know, the, the conventional rate, which is all, all into, you know, it's, it's entrenched in the economy itself in terms of how the economy has evolved. Now, mortgage-backed securities for the Fed holding doesn't have a much impact on the price, uh, but it has a huge impact on the, the drop in volatility. Uh, I, I think it's uh, if you think about it, it's the the Fed is has gone in not so much like a support of the mortgage of the of the mortgage industry, uh, which is what they say, but what they have done is like done the just the most massive uh, put sell that there's ever been. 
Uh, it's uh, I, I did some work on like what the actual uh, Vega was, and it's it's like it, it dwarfs the whole Chicago market. Uh, and I think that's actually has, and that's where we would probably be in agreement, uh, Michael. That that's where I think it, it's bled into the volatility in equity and risky assets and all sorts of things, but not price levels because that volatility really didn't do anything to the the um, evolution of NGDP, of the, of the economy in general. Um, and the evolution of NGDP has gotten so big and so enormous, something that we haven't seen since World War II, that uh, it's, it's, really, it's really not important. Um, so I would like to get off the mortgages. I'd like to find a better way. That's, that's what I got now. It's, uh, it maybe shows how thick-necked I am rather than how bright I am. Uh, I'm working on trying to work with the fine curves um, in terms of like putting assumptions of, uh, of CPI and um, and real growth uh, as a factors into figure out you know the, the, the this Nelson Siegel and various other ways of figuring out a curve, which are basically just um, uh, regression, you know, multi-factor uh, regressions, and uh, and see if like. I can show that okay if we if we get these inputs these factor inputs does it just ridicule the idea of the ten year being where it should I mean it, I think it I think it comes already it comes to using mortgage backed securities and mortgages it already comes to um, the ten year stating ridiculous things about the U S economy even for the next six months let alone for the next you know ten years uh, so I'm working on it I, I I'd like to get a, a a thing such that a, a, um, a trained econometric guy or a trained economist would la just laugh me out of the, out of the, out of the water. Michael, I know, I know you did a lot of work in the yield curve in past lives. So I don't know, maybe you have some ideas on the use of a fine curve and uh, you know, the various other methods for the yield curve determination. Um, but that's why I'm, I'm sort of stuck with this, like, which I do admit is a very, broad stroke, sort of messy idea of using mortgage, mortgage rates for the risk-free, but I'm working on it. At the end of the day, there is a distortion in the curve, that's for sure. I mean, you know, ask the question, why have so many economists been wrong about the, uh, about the, about the uh, boom in the U.S. economy or the recovery in the U.S. economy? Uh, everybody predicted, as far as I could see, that there'd be a recession uh, sometime between the beginning of 2020. Uh, 2023 and 2024, and it clearly hasn't happened. The economy looks like it's accelerating again, uh, whereas the yield curve, the inversion of the traditional yield curve, put everybody on the wrong foot. Now, I think the explanation for that is that there is some bias or distortion in the yield curve, and you know both uh, you know both of us agree that this is all to do with uh, a distortion of the long end of the market. Uh, in other words, it's uh, somehow. The yield on the 10 year, the actual yield is either being talked down by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury or being manipulated down by what they're doing on the issuance front. I think I can explain it and prove it statistically by showing the differential against uh, issuance. Uh, that seems to me the case. And what you're likely to see over coming months is as that issuance shifts back towards more coupons, despite the uh, good offices of the Federal Reserve and maybe their desire to have a lower treasury yield, I think treasury yield is moving up. And I think it's moving up to where the mortgage, the agency mortgage market says it should be, which is over 5%. And what's more, if you, if you, um, you know, uh, if you cross check that by looking at implied term premium, uh, they're beginning to expand as well, uh, as they should, because they're very depressed. So I think all these stars line up. Now, this, this is what I would offer is that we are, we are in agreement with the conditions of the yield curve. Uh, we're in agreement with the term premium. Um, I don't think we're in agreement with how um, entrenched the yield curve is with the economy and the economy with the, with the yield curve. And I don't, I, I basically see the yield curve as a pricing of NGDP uh, forwards. Um, in fact, there's some talk. Uh, the, that, the true yield curve, you're saying? Yeah, yeah the true yield curve. And, yeah, and, well, and and it was the U.S. Treasury yield curve up till like just a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, for forty years prior. Yeah. So that connection, especially with the economy, uh, means that the yield curve is the economy. The economy is the yield curve, and it means that 
the Treasury and the Fed can't do anything about it. So it would mean that that uh, money, uh, our liquidity, uh, but money is cannot be produced in the size or or have the have any effect on what's going to transition with NGDP. And I would say the last step is sooner or later, NGDP will be the, the, the definitive condi- uh, uh, basis for equity value. Um, now, equity value um, has no need, you know, it never is at an equilibrium like this is the price given the this NGDP. Uh, equity is, in my experience, has always been grossly, just massively overshooting and massively undershooting. But at least we know which way the the, the direction of the of the overshoot undershoot is right now, which is under the eventual values of equity. Um, and then I probably, as everyone uh, gets this drift, uh, then the overshoot will be very large. You know, you know, and I think without the Fed. Be, uh, having credibility, which I, I think will be the co- ultimate condition, um, that means that the overshoot will be very large. It'll be a tulip bulb thing. And with that condition, and again, without the Fed, I think my approach will give you an idea to when to cut out, when to leave the party. Uh, I think if you're looking at liquidity, uh, as you put it, as far as I understand it, that, that will give you no... Um, no early indication, early warning that it's time to leave this party. You know, like uh, forget about a punch bowl. Uh, there's actually punch bowls coming in, not not being taken out by the Fed. But as recently as, as 2021, it gave you a very good heads up for the bear market um, that we had, the brief bear market, because liquidity turned down. Uh, we told our clients to get out of the market. And uh, what you had is a pretty significant sell off uh, until uh, September of uh, October. 22 when the market began to revive. So I think that there, there's a down cycle and an up cycle. And I would imagine the next down cycle is likely to be around the end of 2025. It may come sooner, but from what we can project at the moment, that seems more most reasonable. Uh, our view is that liquidity drives the financial markets and the financial markets drive the economy. Uh, and it happens in that sequence. And all our asset allocation is based along that timeline. So we're looking for evidence from the real economy that supports our conclusions. And we think that's happening now because it looks as if the economy is beginning to pick up momentum. And therefore, you're starting to see, as we've been suspecting, the commodity markets are starting to outperform, uh, that commodity-related shares are beginning to pick up, that the gold price is picking up, that U.S. financials led by JPM are uh, outperforming significantly. And all these things are what you'd expect at this stage of the cycle. So uh, so partially the the fact that the yield curve is inverted and it's a distortion, with that exception, this is a very, very normal investment cycle. Michael, so you, with your complex uh, global liquidity model, as well as people who are only looking at the Federal Reserve's balance sheets, both of those classes of, of views were correct in predicting a bear market from you know, January 2022 to the lows in October of 2022. You, you know, I believe around the lows, your liquidity metrics picked up, you know, you, you became you know, bullish and you talked about it on my show and, and, and for clients. And so you, you were right. But I think, you know, the majority of people who only looked at the Fed's balance sheet as they remained bearish and they, you know, people who lived and died on that hill um, were wrong. So I think the perception that there are a lot of people who were wrong to ba- buy or sell stocks based on the Fed's balance sheets. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it, it, it doesn't. Um, the Japanese bear market uh, continued uh, when the Bank of Japan did quantitative easing. Um, I think around 2011, 2012, uh, Japanese shares obviously um, became picked up. But I just want to get George on the record about if the Federal Reserve today, um, let's just, uh, where, where, you know, the five, let's say five-year note. Okay. The, uh, the five-year note is at 4.43%. If the Federal Reserve today, shock and awe, bought, let's say, $200 billion worth of five-year notes today, do you think the yield would go up? or down or stay the same? I think the yield would go down and there'd be a big fuss about it. I think guys like Michael would pick it up. I think that is definitely the popular view and it's a mighty view. I mean, there's a lot of money flowing on that view. And uh, and we've, we've seen it a couple of times, uh, this type of thing. Um, we saw it this morning with CPI. Uh, I haven't looked at the market since we started to show, but it looked like it was starting to get up. Um, sentiment's a powerful thing such that 80% of the right 
sentiment's the way to go. I'm a goof. Uh, it, uh, you're not going to make any money with your Bitcoin if you listen to me. But the, the trouble with with that that obvious uh, connection that you just described is that it won't it won't give you any idea of how to manage a portfolio. It doesn't give you any idea of how to how to manage risk from an asset liability point of view. It it doesn't give you any ideas like when it's going to get weird. Um, and it, it's just it's just dancing to the 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 movements and the and very noisy movements. You know, the Fed wants everyone to know what the hell they did. They'll unleash cash and carry on us. Um, that this will drop five year rates. So who am I to say that it has no effect? But I do say that in terms of economics, uh, I'm going to hang my hat on Fisher and it has no effect. Therefore, what I would do if I were like, if I was just humping around trading is I'd let it come by what you said. And then it's just a great opportunity to be a predator and, and put on some option trades and stuff. Um, and I, I, that is how I made my living. Um, in past, or as a portfolio manager, I, I would uh, I would have to handle all sorts of calls from clients saying, ah, you, you know, you, you told us this was going to happen. Look what happened today. I just saw it in the Wall Street Journal, and you know, and you'd have to walk them through it. And then, uh, you know, when it comes time to renew the the um, the contract, they'll 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 ante up. They'll they'll keep going because you gave them good good uh, good sage advice. To follow the the popular spiel, um, no matter how it seems to be backed by by uh, uh, things like liquidity measures with respect, Mike, and other things is sooner or later, you're, you're going to get clocked, like not just clocked, ruined. Um, and unless you stick with the doxology and the obvious flows, um, you're just setting yourself up to to get into the exuberance and the rushes, We, you know, uh, I went through 87. I went, you know, I, I, I went through a lot of things and that's a, a fairly easy pattern to, to, to get into. And that's where I think um, your question leads to. It, it, it seems to confirm um, a condition which is just pure sentiment. Um, and then when sentiment becomes 130% of the move, then you get in real trouble. So, Lord George, these, these gray hairs mean something. I've been through, uh... I've been through a lot, and uh, I've been using liquidity for a long time. And uh, I haven't been clocked necessarily all that that severely yet. Um, it, it matters hugely. I'll give you. I'll, I'll throw in one final anecdote, which may I'm not necessarily saying I'm going to believe this, but it's an interesting point to ponder. Why has the gold market broken out? Why did it break out when it did? And if you want to, if you want to look at events, uh, you can almost pinpoint it to when Governor Waller said that the Federal Reserve was going to start buying. Uh, or shifting its portfolio towards shorter dated bills, uh, bonds and, or shorter dated coupons and bills. And that was pretty much the trigger for the gold market starting to move northwards quite rapidly. So it seems that the market is actually very sensitive to these whole funding questions, which is what we've been arguing. That's interesting. Wouldn't that comment, uh, the, the Federal Reserve owning more shorter dated bills, wouldn't that be net bearish because it's releasing duration upon the market from the Federal Reserve? Or are you talking about the Treasury? Yeah, but I think that I think the corollary may be coming out of that is if the Federal Reserve is going to hold more short dated bills, maybe the market's thinking the Treasury is going to start issuing a lot more, and that would be uh, a pure monetization. I want to make a, a few comments, which is we talked about empirical evidence. The Federal Reserve bought a bunch of mortgage-backed securities. The spread uh, narrowed; prices went up. You know, as uh, Joseph Wang, who you know neither of you uh, uh, would doubt he his credentials on on the Federal Reserve uh, and. and uh, operations. Somewhat sardonically, he said, I, "I tend to think when the, you buy a trillion dollars worth of something, the price tends to, tends to go up." So you know, there's some empirical evidence that supports it, but there's some that not only there is no empirical evidence that rejects it. So I'll, I'll definitely give you that, uh, George. And for example, I believe it's the case that more often than not, during past instances of post Great Financial Crisis quantitative easing, when the Federal Reserve was buying Treasury bonds, the yields were going up, it means the prices were going down. But again, it doesn't mean that buying Treasury bonds causes the price to go down in, in the same way that, uh, you know, if, if you're sick and you're going to get healthy, no matter what, because that's your body kind of returns to homeostasis. If in the 1700s, the, the doctors gave you leeches, you would get better. It doesn't mean that leeches are, are good for you. A and likewise, if, you know, if you uh, start to get sick and then you go to the hospital and you get even more sick 
after a, a legitimate medical treatment doesn't mean that that medical treatment is bad. So it's often the, the difficulties of choosing cause and effect. And also, uh, George, I believe you said that the reverse repo facility is not a facility. I think what you meant by that is it's not part of it, some grand stratagem, but literally, it, 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 I think it is called the, the reverse repo uh, um, facility. And it is an important mechanism of how the Federal Reserve controls uh, interest rates because of what you alerted to earlier after the great financial crisis. Completely disagree with that. Completely disagree with that. Not now. It used to be, but not now. It used to be part of SOMA. I mean, it was SOMA, but it, it's not now. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, maybe we'll, George, we can attack that on another time. Could I just briefly get both of your views on the asset markets? You both have been uh, uh, ex extremely bullish on on risk assets, You know, mainly, let's say, say the, the stock market. Uh, does that remain uh, to be the case? And perhaps you know, say say a few words about uh, why you think so, Michael. May, you know, may liquidity and, and George, uh, uh, you know, not, not liquidity. But uh, Michael, starting with you, and, and then George. Okay, I think that I would put my views in terms of three time horizons: short term, medium term, longer term. I think the short term, when we're talking about maybe the next, uh, you know, four to eight weeks, I think it's going to be a tough period for markets because the tax gathering season in the U.S. is likely to cause the TGA, the Treasury General Account to catapult higher, and that will be a withdrawal of liquidity from markets. And I don't really see how uh, the Treasury or the Fed can offset that in the near term. So I think there may be some wobbles, but I know this is already a pretty widely talked about fact, and maybe the markets are already digesting it, but you've got to watch out. And the medium term, I put that to the end of 2025, when the liquidity cycle, we think is slated to, uh, to start to retreat. And therefore, I think equity markets will be pretty decent up to then. Although what I've been, well, what we've been saying to our clients is, look, traditionally, uh, after about 15 to 18 months, you've already seen two thirds of the final gains for markets. So uh, the next, uh, you know, the risk reward balance is changing and the next third is going to be tough. For the longer term, I think that the fiscal finances across the West are shot through. I think there's got to be a lot more monetization of debt. I think that, um, uh, that generally speaking, money is going to be printed, liquidity is going to be abundant. And I think what you want are monetary inflation hedges in your portfolio, which extends to gold, uh, to equities, uh, to cryptocurrencies, dare I mention that, uh, and also probably prime real estate, prime residential real estate. Those are the traditional monetary hedges. You do not want a big exposure to government bonds. Thank you, Michael. So you, you remain quite bullish, although I you know, did uh, uh, sense a hint of caution you know, on 18, 18 months from now and, and, and on the, the longer term. George, how bullish are you? you? I mean, you sound ferociously bullish, and you even think that not only will stocks continue to go up, but they'll, they will go to a bubble phase that the stocks will go you know, well, well above their intrinsic value. So, I mean, just how bullish are you whenever you watch financial media? I mean, is there anyone walking on this earth alive who is, who is as bullish as you? I, it seems, seems hard. I, I find... Um, with respect, both you and Michael give too much respect to the Fed um, as why, why wouldn't you? I mean, that's the way it was for 40 years before uh, COVID, uh, actually before 2013. But OK, we've minced, we've, we've chopped that up. I think what's what's coming into is the, the U.S. possibly be going into a catastrophic episode. And by catastrophic, what I mean is that the, the United States must have a Federal Reserve. It is it is so key to maintain democracy, to maintain some sort of uh, quality that that at least is sustainable, so people don't run around and throw bombs. The lack of a Fed is is very very dangerous, and it is the key element for anyone's view, because I, I think it's a layup shot to to look at the fiscal. I mean, it's who can debate it? Um, Congress tied up, and the fiscal keeps uh, uh, flowing in. Uh, I see inflation as a tax, uh, which is what you're describing. I think you're you're describing it. I don't quite understand it, but when you're describing the TGA and the RRP and all this Fed liquidity, uh, I think the inflation is just is a tax uh, in general so that people will have some assurance uh, that they'll get par paid back uh, of the bonds that they're going to buy from the U.S. Treasury. So it will go up when they get less um, comfort uh and it'll go down when they, they're finally very comfortable that the U.S. taxation in the forward market will will cover the debt. Where does that lead us? Um, I think the, the big thing is not the norm of tax seasons and this and that, all that stuff. It's it's like, uh, you know, anyone who's been looking at the market for a year or two has been told to think that. It, it It's going to be that I think last week was very important is that for the first time, and there was, a, I forgot who wrote it, but there's a, um, a guest 
uh, editorial about questioning the Federal Reserve and the Wall Street Journal. I noticed Nick Tamiris is not getting as much uh, daylight as he used to get uh, in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it looks like the Wall Street Journal started to hedge its bets in terms of like basing everything on Nick Tamiris's midnight calls with Michelle Smith uh, from the Fed. The conditions we saw last week, how the market was starting to counter trade to what used to be the usual vaudeville act of all the Fed governors and, and uh, regional presidents talking, and as usual, was capped with cash carry saying this and that. They started to trade against it. Um, they're 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 actually starting to um, sort of rise up in the face of like what the Fed obviously wanted to do was saying, oh, hold on, we, it's not it's not in the cards that we're going to ease. Uh, and they're trying to paint a bearish picture because I think the Fed only reacts, only has a reaction function to the, the market, to the stock market, uh, popular opinion. Uh, so what does this all mean is that I think the market is going to go wilding. They're going to they're going to like give up on the Fed. They're going, to dis, they're going to give up on this whole idea that there's this international organized structure, uh, liquidity, uh, and they're just going to like say, I better buy now or I'm going to be left behind. Uh, and they're also going to come to the realization, as if your portfolio manager at, say, MetLife, that the only real hedge, you can't go buy a bunch of gold if you're running a general account uh, for life insurance. Uh, the only real hedge I have for inflation is stock. Uh, good name stock. So they, they, there'll be a uh, like an 87 nifty 50 type of of surge. Um, so and that will have spillover effects. So I, I'm going to stick with my view that uh, we're going to see 6000 or so by the end of this year and 6% on the US treasuries as people realize that this is somewhat of a con all this all this Fed focus. And then once we get to that point, we're going to get a, a very significant private sector um, uh, almost like a, a pseudo Federal Reserve in the private sector is just going to be created out of nothing uh, as all these various uh, private sector lenders get together. Uh, and that will be the end of the of the speculative phase. Uh, and we'll get into a Ponzi stage, uh, as as, as Minsky has uh, described. Not too hard to uh, uh, to understand it. It's just debt upon debt upon debt, where debt finally is being issued just to finance the previous debt. Uh, just to stay alive. And it becomes like Wiley e. Coyote running off into space. Um, that will take the market probably to levels that will be just bizarre um, and frightening. Uh, so I say 6,000 at the end of this year. I said 5,000 at the end of last year, and I screwed up. I was only three weeks, you know, three weeks later it happened. Um, when this Ponzi stage occurs, and I do think it will occur, um, and for the reasons I just laid out, uh, well, it's almost ridiculous to put a level out. Um, it's like saying, what's the peak of tulip bulbs? Um, and the Fed will start to scramble. Congress will start getting the shit scared out of it. There'll be a new administration in place, whether it's Trump or Biden or whoever. And they'll be starting to they'll start to realize that they're walking right into a a very serious possible crisis in their first year of their new of their first term, and it's going to get crazy. Uh, so, I don't think the Fed can backtrack and reassume like monetarism or the, what it used to have before it went to uh, neo um, yeah, neo Wixell. So I, you know, 6,000 seems like a little strident. The next level, if this does happen, a mis it's going to be wild. It's going to be wild. So so Michael, you, uh, your main, you're quite bullish, but George, you are foaming at the mouth bullish. Think that we'll, we'll go to a Ponzi stage. The end of a Ponzi is the Minsky moment. And that means we'll probably see a 2,000 S&P 500. Uh, okay. So there you go. <laughs> I want my cake and I want to eat it too. Quite, quite dramatic. Uh, George, thanks so much. People can find you on Twitter at Bicker in Brattle, and your Substack is The Monetary Frontier. Uh, Michael, people can find you on Twitter at Cross Border Cap. That is the name of your firm, Cross Border Capital. And then you've also got a Substack called Capital Wars, which is also uh, the name of your book, which, which I uh, have and read and enjoyed. I, I recommend it to people. And incidentally, as you know, Michael, it is how I uh, came up with the name of this show. I said, you know what, Michael Howell, he knows what he's talking about. I'll just go through his index and find some financial term that will be, you know, 
the, the name of my show. And, and that's how I got it. So um, thank you both for having this uh, you know, respectful conversation. You guys disagree on a lot, but, but I've, I've learned a lot and I, I know our audience will too. Uh, thank you both for coming on, sharing your insights and thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, Michael, I owe you dinner if you ever get to New York, okay? That's great. I look forward to it, George. I'll, I'll be over okay, soon. <laughs> thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL.